energy aspect uh -huh. to this because that is the one thing that every time I flirt with it in reading your material or, or anything else where somebody has brought that up, that is a concept that is extremely difficult to mm -hmm. deal with. A lot of people, I think, are familiar with, uh, with Nikola Tesla, for example. Yes. Uh -huh. And when we get a little further past that point, y you know, you, you s you're willing to go all the way to the planet-busting weapons, but I think there's probably so much middle ground there, it it's hard for people to understand it. We're talking, and correct me if, I'm, if I get off track here, when we're talking about the zero-point energy, we're talking, we're bringing into play things like scalar physics, and yes. an entirely different set of physics than the type of thing people are familiar with. Isn't that correct? Well, yes and no. Zero-point energy is actually a, a bona fide artifact of, of the standard model of quantum mechanics. In other words, uh, you can read in most physics textbooks that the zero-point energy has been calculated to be X number of, of joules per unit volume of, of empty space. So in other words, that part of, of the, the zero-point energy problem is well known. It's, it's out there. It's, okay. debated in the pub, it's debated in the public literature. What is not well known is, as you said, there are aspects in physics papers that get overlooked with the advent of relativity and quantum mechanics. All of these other models that scientists were proposing quickly kind of got shuffled to the side, and one of them is scalar physics. Well, there is a paper that was published by E.T. Whitaker, I think, in 1903, which would be two years before special relativity was published by, by Albert Einstein, that goes into quite an interesting mathematical analysis of so-called scalar physics. And he basically comes to the conclusion at the end of this paper that gravity can be explained as an interference pattern, a longitudinal wave, much like Tesla was dealing with, a longitudinal wave in the physical medium. So, you know, this is, <laughs> again, this is 1903. And here's the bad news. When Whitaker published the paper, he published it in Mathematische Annalen in Germany. <laughs> so, you know, the Germans have had access to this stuff for a very long now, time. Now, just to follow that point up from other stuff that I've heard and read from you, if my understanding is correct, it wasn't long after that that this material was then yanked from the public arena and I won't say covered up, but it was definitely, it became extremely sensitive material that the Germans tried to kind of keep to themselves. Isn't that correct? Well, yeah, that's my conclusion based on some things that I have examined in a book called Secrets of the Unified Field. Um, there was a spate of, of publications between the wars in, in the Weimar Republic concerning unified field theory. And the first paper that was published was actually by a, a German mathematician by the name of Theodor Kaluza. And then, of course, Einstein followed that up with uh, two or three papers of his own beginning in 1925 because he so liked the idea that, that Kaluza had employed. But beginning around 1934 to 35, the Nazi regime Polled. In other words, you, you did not find any further publication on unified field theory at all inside of Germany. Right. Now, the standard academic view, Michael, is that, well, the, the Nazis were against so-called Jewish physics, and, of course, Einstein had published the bulk of papers in, in unified field theory. But my reading of it is entirely different. Uh, I think what happened was that the Nazis came to the conclusion, because they had been following the literature, that this was actually, even though an incomplete theory from the theoretical standpoint, that unified field theories were nonetheless engineerable. And if they're engineerable, then by golly, you know, let's do it. <laughs> you know? right. course, so I think that's really what happened. Right. And of course, you know, develop weapons. I mean, we're not just going to use this for uh, for <laughs> for peaceful purposes. We're going to go ahead and militarize it immediately. And Exactly. Wow, that is incredible stuff. So speaking of militarizing this type of technology, here's something uh -huh. for listeners of our show that may uh, remember a couple of episodes back, and Howard, you'll remember this discussion. Um, after the earthquake in Haiti, this, this couldn't have possibly not gotten onto your radar, but if it didn't, I'm going to really be excited that I'm the first person to ask you this question. After the <laughs> well, major earthquake... I, I can tell you, you're probably not, but go ahead. Probably <laughs> not. The, fir the earthquake that struck Haiti a few months back... Um, in what really seemed to be sort of a bizarre tangential 
uh, comment, n none, other, none other than President Hugo Chavez of Venezuela came right, up with a right. bizarre accusation that this was a U.S. weapon or some sort of weaponized technology that had caused this earthquake, a statement that was then apparently rescinded very quickly. Uh, would it be too far out there for me to draw some connection or conclusion here? Uh, no. In my opinion, um, the way I interpret that, that the, the Haiti quake was probably the product of the technology, number one. That's, that's my, my sincere opinion. I don't think that it was our technology that did it. Sure. Um, I think that you have to look at the Haiti quake and then the subsequent Chile quake as kind of a uh, message and response. In other words, someone else's technology produced the Haiti quake and the response was the Chile quake. Now, the Chile quake is very significant to me for two different reasons. The first reason is it occurred in an area of Chile where there was a large and still is a large, uh, shall we say, German presence. Okay. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. Yes, yes. The the, it, the quake occurred very close to the old uh, Nazi compound known as Colonia Dignidad, which of course was shut down eventually. But there is still a heavy German presence in that area, and my suspicion would be that some of it is connected to the activities of this, this post-war Nazi international. So that's the first thing we have to look at with the Chile quake. The second thing we have to look at that signals that a technology, in my opinion, is in play is the magnitude of the quake was something like, I think, 8.7 on the Richter scale, which is just an enormous quake. And, of course, the predictions in the news media immediately were, well, there's going to be tsunamis in Hawaii, there's going to be tsunamis in Japan, and, of course, this is true had it been a natural quake. Right. There should have been tsunamis. But Hawaii, I think, had something like a two- to four-foot wave. <laughs> you know, yeah. this, is, this is hardly a tsunami. That's okay. Right. Well, this to me says that there was a technology in play to damp the inertial effects of the quake. This is the only way, really, to explain what happened after that quake in terms of, you know, water is a fairly uh, frictionless medium, and therefore it should have transmitted the shock from that quake rather effectively and efficiently. So, uh, you know, there had to have been some sort of technology, in my opinion, in play in order to, to pull that off. So that's the way I look at it. I think you have someone sending a message to whomever with the Haiti quake and then someone else responding with their own earthquake in Chile. <laughs> well, and something that will make those of us that live with, you know, our show is coming from, from the Washington, D.C. area. Again, this is time Oh, joy. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just going to say, you're listening to Time and Space, and we're speaking to Dr. Joseph Farrell. And for those of us that live in this area, uh, we will take note of a very bizarre occurrence, at least we would consider it bizarre around here, that not two days ago we had what earthquake was Earthquake under Germantown. Was, that's right, an earthquake in Germantown, Maryland, which was noted <laughs> as being the highest recorded in this area. My wife was quick to point out that they'd only been recording that kind of thing for 30 years, but that didn't make me feel much better. And uh, no. <laughs> for those of us who aren't used to earthquakes, that was a really surprising experience. My windows were rattling, and they said it measured at, at about a 3.6. So I, I would hate to read much into it. You didn't feel anything out here? Didn't feel anything. We're a little bit west of Washington recording this right now. Howard lives out in the closer to the Manassas area. But, uh, uh -huh. yeah, it was, it was something I, I got to admit. I woke up, I heard the windows rattling, and the first person I thought of was you. I thought, I'm, I'm <laughs> recording this interview in a few days, and I'm going to ask him about this. What are the odds? So then let me move uh, to something else that, again, listeners of the show are going to get a kick out of because several months ago, I guess towards the end of last year, we interviewed uh, Stanton Friedman, of all people. And uh -huh. I said to Mr. Friedman, I, I, I got a, a laugh from him in pointing this out, that I didn't know if there was some sort of strange academic rivalry or something going on, but that you had maybe put out a few remarks that, um, sort of contradicted some of the stuff that maybe not Friedman directly, but that the UFO community uh, like to say. And we asked Friedman about the bell, and you know the bell is is tricky enough to understand. But we we asked Friedman directly, you know, what credence do you give to that theory? Do you think that the bell was a real thing? What do you have to say about Farrell's work? And at first he sort of 
you know, said, well, I don't know, I don't really have any comments. And for some reason, about 60 seconds later, he spoke up and said, you know, I do have a comment. He pointed out to us that he felt that while it was a, a, an interesting theory and it was a lot of interesting information, that it was all paper studies, that everything was just documentation and that that doesn't really prove anything. And I'm wondering how you respond to something like that. Well, my response is rather simple. Uh, one could say the same thing about a lot of ufology. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> because effectively what you have there are stories being told by people who have seen things or remembered things on the one hand. And on the other, uh, you know, Mr. Friedman has done yeoman's work for a number of years sure. in establishing a, a pro-authenticity case for a number of the Magic 12 documents. So uh, on the other hand, you, you certainly have within ufology a, a reliance upon um, documents, be they genuine or, or, or something else, depending on one's lights. So, you know, my, my response to that is simply that you have the very same sort of case being made. Um, it is, in each case, admittedly, a circumstantial case, but I don't think that that necessarily makes it invalid, nor do I think that it makes it uh, a weak case. And In fact, I think the case is probably as strong, if not stronger, for the bell. You know, I've written basically uh, six books on Nazi technology, all of them having the bell as a theme. So in other words, had I thought that this was a an insignificant case, I certainly wouldn't have sure. written six books about it. Sure. And then even going further into that, and I, I exist in a, a more of a criminal justice world, a law enforcement world um, for uh, you know my day job, if you will, um, the okay. idea of forensic evidence is one that I constantly reach back to when discussing right. this type of stuff on the show. And to, to bring up um, Bitkowski again, I saw a rerun of the, I think it was a Discovery Channel special that they were running discussing the bell and maybe trying to tie it to the Kecksburg case and all this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Bitkowski is out there standing in the middle of what appears to be some sort of test facility, and you've referenced this type of thing as well. There's a lot yeah. more physical evidence for the bell and for, for that you know, particular case than there ever could be for ufology, it would seem. Oh, yes, absolutely. In my opinion, you're absolutely right. And, and I do want to make one statement for the record. I am the first person on the record publicly to have drawn a connection between the Bell and the Kecksburg uh, crashed oh, UFO. Oh, I didn't know yes. that. Yes, I, I did that in a book. Uh, I published the first one in my Nazi series of books called The Reich of the Black Sun. Ah. Uh, okay. So others others have kind of picked up on that, but I was the first one out there with that. I just you know I got to toot my own horn here. <laughs> Please do, definitely. Well, now and just out of curiosity, if I if I can, maybe I hope it's not a sore spot. But why didn't we see you in the Discovery Channel special? Where? Oh, that that is a sore spot. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to ask that, but I couldn't help but think of watching the show. Well, let's put it this way. Um, sometime, sometimes the ethics of TV journalists is less than what you would expect. Yeah, that's not um, a surprise, right? Yeah, that's not a surprise.